Well, hello everybody. It is your friendly fishmonger, Dan from dansfish.com. And today we're going to talk about a beautiful little fish that's highly sought after. It's the peacock gudgeon. I said it right. Usually I say gungeon, like a gun with a glass of gin. Gun gin. But gudgeon, only one N. <laughs> um, beautiful little fish. And um, yeah, let's take a look and I'll tell you about them. All right, so here they are. Let's take a look. Um, just fed them some frozen brine shrimp so that uh, we can get them out and feeding. Um, so the peacock gudgeon, Tetrundina ocelacauda. Um, I have no idea what Tetrundina means, but I know ocelacauda means spot tail or spotted tail uh, because of that big black spot they have on their, their tail fin. So these are a beautiful, peaceful, non-food aggressive, not really quick moving little gudgeon from Papua New Guinea where a lot of our rainbow fish come from. Um, they're often called a peacock goby or rainbow goby sometimes. They're not truly a goby though. They're um, more closely related to uh, sleepers and things like that which the, the main difference as I understand it is gobies has a, have a fused pelvic fin. So um, the fin down below, those two little fins, are fused together in a cup which allows the gobies to kind of grab onto things, stick onto things. That's why they can kind of climb the glass and stick on stones and things like that. The gudgeons don't have that, but they're similar in many other aspects. Um, now these guys are, they're not at all aggressive. If you only had two in a tank, you might get a little bit of aggression, I suppose. but in a group they flare their fins and they have dominance displays but they don't really attack each other they're almost an ideal temperament for a community tank and you can keep them together just fine and if you only have a few in a tank as long as you have visual barriers and different caves for them to kind of hide in and hang out in then you'll be just fine i i don't think there's a, a a large amount of aggression issues with these guys. Um, I'm keeping this batch in with some Aplicylus dei, uh, a more or less surface dwelling killifish from Sri Lanka, and I don't have any problems with them together. I have another batch that I'm keeping with some uh, rice fish, some daisies rice fish, Wawore species, and I don't have any problem with that either. Now, if I kept them with a, another fish that was really food aggressive, there might be some problems because these guys are not super quick moving. And so um, they might not get to the food in time. But keep them with fairly, um, fairly laid back consp uh, tank mates and they'll be just fine. I would think that things like garamis, um, things like different kinds of bettas, um, things of that nature would do do just fine. So anyway, a, a kind of an ideal aquarium fish temperament wise, color wise, absolutely stunning. I don't really need to describe that because you can see it here on the video. The one thing I will mention is the difference between males and females. If you look at this one, this is I think a female because the dorsal and anal fin extensions are not protruding down past into the tail fin. Um, females also often have a black margin on the dorsal and the anal fin, but not always. So if the dorsal and the anal fins, when they're kind of laid down against the body, protrude past into the tail fin, then it's probably a male. And also later on, the males will get a nuchal hump, so they'll get this kind of big hump on the top of their head, and you can tell males that way. These fish in the video are young enough that they haven't developed the hump, so you can't really tell by looking at the, the head hump. Now one thing I want to clarify is I'm not sure where this got started and maybe there's someone out there, oh look at that nice flare, maybe there's someone out there that does have a three inch peacock gudgeon but I've never seen one that big. I've kept a lot of these guys both in my personal um, collection and also at, at pet stores and wholesalers and things and I've never seen a three inch peacock gudgeon. The most I've seen is maybe two to two and a half inches so often you'll read that they get three inches I haven't seen it. I'm not saying it can't happen, but I think this here I'm pretty sure is a female. If you look at those black margins on the top and the bottom and notice that the uh, 
um, dorsal and anal fin kind of end right before the tail instead of extending into the tail. Anyway, I've never seen one, so I would say two inches, two and a half is maybe the max. So if anyone out there does have a three inch, I would love to see it. <laughs> that would be spectacular. Um, as far as feeding, these guys have some kind of reputation for not being the easiest to feed, but I think that that comes from their close uh, appearance to like the gobies, which can often be so keyed into live food that it's hard to get them to eat flake food um, and pellets and things. But these, uh, the peacock gudgeons in my tanks, they'll eat flake food, they'll eat pellet food, they'll eat frozen food, they'll eat live food, they'll eat all kinds of things. I have no trouble feeding them whatsoever. So they're actually very easy to feed. Um, I do want to bring up, there's a lot of, you'll see a lot of detritus kind of floating around in the water and on the bottom of the tank. And that's because I put hardwood leaves in this tank for the uh, gudgeons to kind of get in and hang out in and stuff. And as those kind of break down, they create kind of this fine particulate matter, which the gudgeons then um, stir up because they hang out mostly on the bottom of the tank in the lower levels of the tank. So I just want to clarify that that stuff floating around in there, all those little particulates and that stuff on the bottom of the tank, it's nothing unhealthy or anything like that. It's just breaking down uh, tree leaves is what that is. I mean, look how beautiful this is. Oh, those are such gorgeous fish. Um, what else did I want to say about these guys? Oh yeah, breeding these guys. So I've, I've bred them uh, many times. I've never raised the young, so I guess I haven't truly bred them. I don't really consider that I bred a fish until I've raised at least one generation um, from the eggs into adulthood, um, or big enough to resell, I suppose. But they bred several times, and the way they do it is that's what those pipes are for right there. And you can kind of see those leaves that I mentioned earlier in there kind of slowly breaking down. But in these pipes, these are half inch PVC pipes, they'll go in there, the male will kind of claim a territory, and you want to always make sure that you have more pipes than you do males. Or if you're using rocks, more rock caves than you do males. As long as you have more caves available than you do males, then you're not going to have a lot of territorial issues. And also you kind of want to space them out a bit. This is kind of the middle of the tank, but I have more of these on each end of the tank as well, along with some flower pots and things like that. So anyway, the male will kind of claim a cave, which is can be a pipe or a, a flower pot or even a curled up leaf. And um, they'll entice the female into it. And it's really funny to watch. They'll kind of wiggle and dance and try to get the female to come in, kind of nudge her over. Um, trying to get her to enter the pipe. And when she does, then they'll spawn in there. The male will guard the eggs, just like gobies do. But as soon as the eggs are free swimming, he's gonna start wanting to eat them. So I'd be really careful if you wanna raise these fish about, um, about raising the babies in with the adults. So that could be really problematic. The best way I think is to, um, right before they are hatching, is to take the pipe out. You kind of put, uh, a finger on the end to keep the water in there, lift it out of the tank, move it over to a hatching tank with a little air stone. Um, you don't want too much current, so you don't want to put the bubbles directly on the eggs, but you want to ensure that there's some air flow, uh, some water flow going across the eggs so that they have enough oxygen to hatch. They'll hatch in a few days, um, and the reports say that they're big enough to eat microworms and baby brine shrimp. Again, I've never removed them to raise them. But they've spawned for me several times. They seem to be very simple to spawn. Um, the literature also says that these guys come from soft water streams and um, ponds and things like that in Papua New Guinea. And so I have soft water. They're doing great in my water. But I've also talked to lots of people who have bred them and kept them successfully in hard water too. So they seem to be very forgiving um, of different water parameters. Um, they're also very hardy. I, I don't run into a lot of disease issues with these fish. Um, I have occasionally just in, uh, noticed some sluggishness or something like that. It's very rare. Um, maybe a little clamping of the fins and then I'll do some uh, just a little medication to uh, clear that up. But I've never had anything to the point where they were dying on me or, I, or there was a huge concern or anything like that. Temperature wise, I keep these guys in the mid 70s, about 73 to 78 degrees, mostly 75, right around there. And they seem to do just great, no problems whatsoever. 
Um, they do tend to hang out on the bottom of the tank or the bottom layers of the tank. They're not like gobies, they don't necessarily like perch on things. They kind of just hover over the bottom. Um, and so when you're planning an aquarium with these guys, if you can use them as the kind of bottom layer and find some fish for the top layer and you would be in, in great shape. That's why I have them in, in here with these killifish because the killifish, I mean here you see them on the bottom, they do come down but they tend to stay at the top and these guys tend to stay closer to the bottom and so you can kind of divide up the different areas of the tank that way and um, have you know don't have too much crowding or competition because they each have their little niche. Um, now peacock gudgeons they are commercially produced and have been for quite a while. I would be very surprised if any of the fish offered for sale are wild collected. Um, I think they're all going to be commercially produced. But because they are not like a tetra or a barb or something like that that lays just enormous clutches of eggs um, and can be group spawned and you can get tons of eggs at once, they lay smaller batches of eggs and protect them. That's kind of their strategy. And so because of that, they are not as productive at a farm. And so the price point is, is quite high. Um, it's not outrageous. But you're very rarely going to find like really inexpensive. You're not going to find like a dollar peacock gudgeon. Um, I would say if you can find one under ten dollars, you're doing great. Fifteen and under is probably in the United States at least more or less what they go for uh, generally. Now, of course, there's some flexibility on that if you can get them from a hobbyist or if a store gets a really good deal or something like that. But just because of the nature of how they spawn, they're there is a, a certain price point to these guys, just like killifish and a lot of the other rainbow fish and the other fish that don't produce massive batches all the time. So that's, um, let's see, what else did I want to say about these guys? That's about the rundown. Just a super peaceful, super colorful fish. They remind me of a Fundula Panchax Gardener at killifish, but they're awesome. All right, I, I hope you like that species profile of the peacock gudgeon. Um, great little fish, beautiful, peaceful, awesome, does well in many, many aquarium setups. Um, if you have a question or comment about this species or their care or anything fishy related, really, uh, drop it down below, below, and um, we'll get a discussion going. All right, have a good one, and uh, we'll talk to you later.